Hello, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Mary Breckel, and I'm a doctor of physical therapy here at Jefferson Healthcare. I work downstairs in outpatient rehab on the waterside entrance of the clinic. And I also, when it's not COVID, teach exercise classes at our wellness center. So obviously, we're all looking forward to COVID being over. But until then, we're home being safe, and that's why we're doing this virtually. So this will be um, a shortened version of a presentation I usually do in person a couple times a year that's all about managing osteoporosis or reduced bone density with exercise and basically physical therapy because that's my specialty. So if you have a question as we go, please feel free to post on uh, the Facebook event and we will address the questions at the end as a group. That would be really helpful. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions if you have any. So next slide here. Um, again, thanks for tuning in. We're really gonna focus on exercise. So next slide. Great, so today our objectives are to talk a little bit about what osteoporosis or osteopenia are. And then after that, talk about the current evidence-based treatment. What's the best treatment method for having better bone density? Um, then we'll get into prioritizing specific types of exercise in order to support optimal bone health. And then we'll talk about how to move mindfully and properly with good body mechanics uh, throughout the day. And then again, we'll finish with that Q&A. So we can go to the next slide there. So what is osteoporosis? It literally means porous bone, which means that the bone matrix has holes in it, like a sponge. And so the more space in the bone there, there is, you are more osteoporotic. There's more bone mineral loss. So it's diagnosed by a DEXA scan, and that can be done every two years, is usually how often they are done. Um, your primary care provider would order a DEXA scan, and then if they find out that you have reduced bone density, they would generate other care from there. So the T-score is how you're diagnosed with osteoporosis, and that is on the DEXA report. So if you have osteoporosis, the number on your T-score will be negative 2.5 or worse. So negative 2.5, negative 3.5, negative 4 would all be T-scores for osteoporosis. If there's a little bit less bone than normal, but not yet porosis, that would be osteopenia and that's between negative one and negative 2.5. And then of course, normal bone loss is anything better than negative one. So negative one to zero or better than zero would be in the normal category. It is actually normal to lose bone as we age. Um, so we wanna have a healthy bone bank when we're in our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s so that as we lose bone as we age, we're not getting into osteopenia, osteoporosis over time. If you are looking at a Z-score, um, that's something that is actually age-matched. So the T-scores compare you to healthy 30-year-olds. That's really what we diagnose osteoporosis on. Next slide here. So what's the best treatment for this? Really what they have found is that a team approach that's comprehensive, that's determined by the provider is the best way to go. And that means you're not probably only gonna see your primary care provider if you have osteoporosis. They will likely and hopefully send you to physical therapy so that we can establish a helpful home exercise program and teach you other things to manage this condition on an ongoing basis. It may also be part of your care that the, that the provider decides to send you to a dietitian or nutritionist or perhaps to talk with a mental health provider um, if stress and isolation and other things like that are going on. Other team members may be an endocrinologist or a social worker. And they found that prevention is the best treatment. So we really don't want to wait until after someone has had a compression fracture or fallen and broken their hip to initiate care. We want to do the DEXA scan, find out the risk of fracture, and then provide treatment preventatively, especially people with family history of osteoporosis. It's really important to be um, you know, mindful and start asking for DEXA scans even before you're 65. If you've had you know, hairline stress fractures or other things that may hint that there's some bone 
weakness going on. So next slide. Some common issues um, that people have that have osteoporosis are, first of all, a postural dysfunction. So that may look like height loss. We have, you know, I often hear, oh, my grandmother lost six inches by the time she passed away when she was 90 and she had osteoporosis. And that person may be 60 and coming into PT for shoulder pain, I may encourage them to talk with their provider and make sure that they know their risk level and their bone density at that time. There can also be pain. So something that happens with postural dysfunction is some strain in certain predictable muscle groups and joints and things like that that can cause chronic pain. And it may be just a nagging annoyance type of pain, not a severe acute pain, but those are still really important things to tell your provider and to get treatment for in physical therapy because they can relate. If we can address your pain, we can actually lower your fracture risk in the future. Um, we also see muscle weakness. So part of that ties into my next point, which is we're not participating as fully in normal life events that we may want to. So if we have a grandchild, we may be hesitant to lift that grandchild up because we don't want to hurt ourselves while we do it. Or we used to go to yoga and now we don't feel comfortable doing that anymore because we don't want to hurt ourselves. So that can cause muscle weakness just due to, you know, wanting to be careful or, hey, we just talked about pain. You can't go on a walk because it hurts. So now you're going to get weaker and deconditioned over time. And then another thing that's very common is actually dizziness. So Sometimes it's actually vertigo, which is related to ear crystal dysfunction um, in our vestibular system. That actually correlates with osteoporosis because bone has calcium and the ear crystals are made of calcium. And so oftentimes someone will have this vague dizziness and actually it is vertigo that's being untreated for a long time. That can cause some of these postural dysfunctions because they give us a false sense of gravity. So ear crystals tell us if we're up or down. If I'm then sideways or a little bit forward because this feels normal because of the ear crystal problem, that will just perpetuate my bone loss and, and issues regarding that. That can lead to falls, instability, fear of movement. So those are really common issues. Next slide here. So really we wanna talk about foundations of body positioning. I brought our little friend Bones here um, just to kind of show you the spinal column. So I'll slide Bones toward me a little bit and then I'll get him, her back. So here we've got our spine. Now this might be what some of you look like. Bones is in a forward bend. That's how Bones hangs out. So the head's actually forward of the body, and what we want is that the ear stacks right over, there that goes, we'll talk about that in a minute, stacks right over the shoulder and the hip. So we want this all in a plumb line um, so that we're not having a forward head. <clears throat> so if we don't have that good foundation to start with, it can then be really hard to get moving, keeping a good position. So you can practice this at home. You're in the privacy of your own home. How nice to have that to practice. But what I want you to practice is actually belly tight. So just drawing your navel in toward your spine. And then after you practice that, you can practice whether you're sitting or standing, having your tailbone long. And so what that means, a lot of us actually stand either like this or kind of like this, when really we want our tailbone long to the earth with that um, belly button engaged. And then lift with the heart. So we're just lifting our chest, which a lot of us can have shoulders kind of coming around our body. That'll take our spine that way. So we want to lift our chest and then you can take your finger to your mouth and you can say shh and then pull your head back just gently. So again, that's belly tight, tailbone is long. We want to have our chest high and then we shh and we pull our head back. That helps keep everything in good alignment. So for example, if you're sitting at the computer watching a Facebook Live event and you start to get some discomfort in the back of your neck, notice if maybe your head is hanging forward. 
maybe you can work on that shh and pull your head back and that'll decrease strain to your spine. Also consider why is posture the way it is? Are you dizzy? Do you have glasses that need you know, a new prescription? Do you have a progressive that you're always peering to look in the bottom of when really you really need some separate reader glasses? So just consider those things, especially if you've been working hard on posture already and know, man, I'm still constantly catching myself forward. We want to address the root cause of that posture issue. So that's a little bit about the background of osteoporosis. Now we'll talk exercise. So next slide here. So exercise is really cool because not only can it improve your bone density numbers, and we'll talk about how it does that, but it can also improve your strength, decrease your fall risk, um, reduce fragility of our whole body, so how fragile are we are because of weakness and other issues. Medications can't do that. So even if you are willing to take some of the bone health medications for osteoporosis, those aren't going to improve your strength. They're not gonna improve your posture. They won't improve your cardio, right? Whereas exercise can help the bones and do all that other stuff. That's why we like it. And evidence-based care includes both medicine and exercise. So to continue um, on the next slide, we're talking about alignment. And we need to have proper alignment that we just talked about where the ears over the shoulder over the hip but what if something is too tight to get into line? Well, we might need to do some stretching or other range of motion exercises. So she can pull up, uh, pull up the full slide view. And if we want um, healthy spines, we want arms and legs that can move freely. So looking at the slide, there's four pictures of different hamstring stretches. And this is just a little pop quiz, or you can think about this which stretch looks like the best one for someone with osteoporosis. So if we are talking about the one that's farthest to the left on the slide where she's in a seated forward bend, a long sitting forward bend, I will just talk you through the answers because you're not here live. That spine is fully curved forward. So that would actually be contraindicated, which is a medical term for not recommended um, for if you have lower bone density. The peak of her curve of her spine is in the mid back, and that's where people are most likely to have a compression fracture when we strain into these positions. So we wouldn't recommend that. The second one is a little better because her spine's a bit straighter, but I can see that she's rotating and bending forward, which is another thing that can increase injury risk, especially with lower bone density. The third one's a little better even so, but with that one, her neck is actually kinked up. And that is a, that's something we don't really think about. We think my head is not my spine, but your neck is part of your spine. And that's what that head is connected to. So if she was actually looking at her back foot, that would be a fine you know, pose to do for hamstring stretching. The best one is actually the very last one. She's laying on the floor. The spine is fully supported. All the muscle groups can relax so that she can get the best stretch to her hamstrings so that then she's able to bend forward and pick something up without bending in her back. So the next um, topic, the next type of exercise, other than flexibility training, which is what we just talked about is some stretching, would be balance training. So we want to be steady in our body. Balance exercises can tune up a lot of different systems of our body. So if I know that I start losing my balance when I'm on a walk with my friend and I weave toward them as we talk, that might indicate that we need to do some practice walking and turning our head, for example, so that we don't veer when we walk. And if we try to practice that and it doesn't get better, that may indicate that there's a problem with the inner ear. And that's why physical therapy is important and can help you. So it also can tune up your sensitivity of your body awareness. So feeling, oh, I'm a little right, or I'm a little bit left, or I'm toward the front edge of my balance or the back edge. And that's really important so that we're not always at one edge of our balance halfway into a fall, then we catch our toe and we fall. Instead of being upright, good alignment, I catch my toe and my foot gets back on the ground instead of having an, an event. 
Um, reaction speed can also be fine-tuned. So if you are practicing tree pose and you realize you need to get your foot down, the speed of that reaction gets better and better as we train it with balance training. So especially for hip fractures, those are due to falls almost always. And we can really reduce fall risk if we work on balance. So the next category of exercise is strengthening. And in the research, there's a lot of evidence that shows if you use a high amount of load, so some dumbbells that are heavier, or some resistance bands that are firmer, um, that you can work up to over time, those kind of things are really helpful because they make the muscles work really hard. And when the muscle works really hard, it pulls on the bone that it's attached to. And when the bone gets pulled on, it says, oh, I'm being used. I need to add more density so that I can withstand this load. And that's exactly why we do high load strength training. So a lot of patients I've had say, oh yeah, I do weights, I do one pound weights every day and I do this. And that's really good, but that's not going to help your hip get better density. You need to be loading with more pounds that you can add over time up to maybe five, six pounds with an ankle weight or a stiff tube resistance, and you need to do hip exercises. That's where those muscles will pull on that hip bone where we need it to be stronger. Other areas really great to exercise are your back. So leaning forward and, and lifting up can help to strengthen your back, especially if you're all the way face down, like off the edge of a bed and also abdominal exercises. And again, that's the first thing I mentioned when we talked about foundational posture, belly tight, right? If we don't know how to engage those postural muscles, it's gonna be hard to add on from there without having a risk of an injury. So we wanna do strength training a couple times a week. That's the recommendation. And again, it's high load that we need. That means a lot of weight. So the next category, which is the last one, is cardio. And that's what, actually why I brought this weighted vest to put on our friend. So the weighted vest is a way to add more load to normal walking. It's not something to be worn while you're cleaning up your house or doing other activities like throughout the day because we wanna always be upright to gravity when we're wearing the weighted vest. So the research shows that if you walk three to four times a week for 30 to 45 minutes, with a weighted vest that your hip bone score, your T-score will improve or at least not continue to progress in loss relative to a control group. So that's what we base our recommendations on is that research. Now, what if you can't walk at all, even without the vest due to pain? Well, that's why hopefully you'd be coming to PT. Address, hey, how can we get this person walking without pain so that they can either tolerate walking, which is at least weight bearing, or eventually build up into walking with a weighted vest. So it's really important that the vest is fitted, snug to the body. So I would be uh, zipping this up and I would be taking in the sides so that it's really well snug to the person. Um, if it's baggy, it can pull you one way or another, which actually can strain your back instead of help your density. That's also why we don't recommend wearing a backpack. So remember that strolling is not cardio. So walking the dog when the dog is just sniffing along, that's good physical activity, but that's not the same as, hey, I'm breathing more heavily, or I need to pace talking with walking. That's how you know you're doing cardio. And it can also be helpful to use a pedometer. So we find that when people use you know, step counters, even just for a short amount of time, you get a better idea of how much you're actually walking in the day and can have some objective data to set goals on, which can be motivating. For the weighted vest, you wanna start with one to two pounds in the vest. That's if you don't have pain while walking or don't have pain that worsens while walking. And then you would add a pound or two a week. So finally, just recapping um, on exercise, what we recommend per week is cardio exercise. So the recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate activity a week. So however that's broken up, it needs to be in at least 10 minute intervals. And then the second category is resistance or strength training. I said that that's twice a week. You might do two sets of 10 of some bicep curls so that you can lift something and not hurt your back. 
two sets of 10 of some hip exercises, um, two sets of 10, you know, again, lifting up in your back. And then balance. We also want to work on our balance a couple times a week and doing a variety of activities, not just tree pose, but what happens if you close your eyes and balance? Is there a little bit of sway that makes you, oh, I haven't done that in a while. We want to have variety so that we have a lot of protection against different situations that could make you fall. And then finally, that flexibility. So we talked about that hamstring stretch. You may have certain areas of your body that are so tight that they really need some heavy stretching um, to get to neutral alignment. And then in general, we want to be stretching twice a week once we're pretty normal to not lose that. It's good to stretch daily if something is really tight. That's how you'll make the best gains. So getting into the second chunk of today's talk, which is more about mindful movement and body mechanics. So we're taking our foundation of our spine alignment and then we're gonna move it through space. So I'm gonna pull out a chair to just demonstrate something. So you can see even as I pick up this chair and set it down, that my spine is straight. I'm bending at my hips. I'm not picking the chair up like this. So that's just a little preview. <laughs> but we're going to be doing um, a sit to stand. So I'm going to have a seat. And what I want, you, and you can practice this at home if you want. Um, I want you to hinge forward at that hip crease so that you're shifting your weight from your tush to your feet. And I'm even actually hovering my buns off the chair. I'm hovering and then I can use my tush to finish standing upright. I did lean back a little bit and I went, uh-oh, that's not right. <laughs> I don't want to lean back. So we want to be nice and upright when we finish. And then we can hinge to sit back down again. So that's how we use our spine and have good hamstring flexibility to be able to tip forward to spare our backs from having to do all the work. So the what not to do, which I'll only do once, would be this kind of thing where we're pushing on our legs, our spine's all crooked, and then finally we get upright. Um, so that's a sit to stand. And then really, throughout the day, if your muscles get tired, you want to support yourself. So if you've been sitting on a yoga ball for 20 minutes trying to work your core, and your back's getting tired, you want to give your back a rest. And that means actually using a backrest. So that's something that's good to do that a lot of times people say, oh, I didn't know I should do that. I thought I should be on this yoga ball all day. Well, that can kind of strain your muscles and make them more tired. So let your back have a rest. That's part of healthy movement. So again, I'm hinging forward. Because my arms are not really weak, I can bring this chair toward me and stand up and then I can safely move it away. So that's a little bit about how we take our straight spine and we use it during the day to move things around and get what we want done. The next slide that we can pull up in the big view, we want to again set our trunk in a fixed position so that it's stable. That's why we have a strong core, strong back muscles. And then we can do things like chores. So this slide shows examples of vacuuming in a way that's either healthy and helpful because it's heavy work, which uses your muscles, or not helpful because it's done in poor positioning and can kind of perpetuate chronic pain issues. So vacuuming, again, we hip hinge, we use our arms and we, um, and our legs to get that job done instead of our back. Same thing with dishes, tucking a foot up in the cupboard can alleviate any hamstring tension um, and that can help you lean forward over the dishes without stooping in your back and your neck. Gardening, we get this one a lot where, hey, my back hurts worse after I garden. Um, making sure we have strong enough legs and glute muscles, which are our, our bottom, our, our tush, to stand up and push and pull what we need to do, um, it's really important for gardening. So you see that one where she's trying to lift something with her spine curved over versus using a, a half kneel lunge to get what she wants done. And then finally, positioning at a computer. You know, are we hanging forward over the computer or is the chair tucked in under the desk um, to get our body to be able to be straight while we're sitting at the computer? 
Laptops are notorious for being a little bit problematic because the monitor is just inherently going to be too low. So if you are at that computer a lot, it would be a great idea to get a Bluetooth keyboard that you can set at a height that's level with your arms so you can have the monitor up where you need to see it. And again, if glasses are the problem, if we're peering to see um, through a part of our progressive, maybe you need a distance just for screen that you leave at your computer. My mom personally has that set up and she likes it a lot. Uh, next slide here. So whatever you do though, the important part is to keep up on it. Bone density, bone is something that breaks down and then gets remodeled all the time, every day. We're losing it and then we're gaining it. Um, and that's why having enough calcium in our bloodstream is really important. So talk to your doctor about calcium supplementation at the very least. Um, but we need to keep up on this. Doing PT for you know, 12 visits is not the thing that's going to help your bone density. Really getting in a regular routine of doing these things, again, twice a week um, for the strengthening activities is a really great idea. And then however you want to break up that 150 minutes of, of loading weight-bearing cardio is the other thing. There's been studies that show that after two years, if you don't usually go to the gym, but you join the gym, you're probably gonna not be at the gym within two years. So if you don't really love going to the gym, if you're not crazy about it, just don't even do it. Maybe spend that money on some hand weights or some ankle weights or a foam balance pad, something that your PT um, or other exercise tech who's helped you has determined is helpful for you. And then I'd also encourage you to not wait until after COVID is over. Um, I really understand and empathize with, you know, having a lot of comorbidities and being in a high risk category and wanting to be very safe. We take your safety really seriously. Um, and, you know, we distance, we've got our masks on, we've got goggles on. We really make an effort to have it be safe. And if it's something that you want to limit your exposure, I'll have patients who say, I'm willing to come in three times. I need you to train me on something I can do during COVID. And I'll come in three times if I can, you know, have a space where I'm not around other people. And we can definitely make that happen for you. So that's important to us that you feel safe coming in. And lastly, just I would encourage you today to make some goal or set up some plan that you have to help get better at this stuff. It could be, hey, you already did it. You attended this event, you learned something. Um, maybe make a goal because a year from now, you'll wish you had started today is a saying that I like to say. So now I will take some questions that may have come up on the feed. Ah, okay, so weighted vest. Um, if someone is within a healthy BMI, which is that body mass index, we still encourage a weighted vest. So people that are overweight, your muscles have already accommodated to that amount of weight. So if it doesn't hurt your joints to add 10 more pounds, that would be something that for bone density, I would recommend. Now we're going to go like this, you know, we're gonna see what's the pros and cons of adding that weight if you have other things like arthritis and that would be better dealt with in person and physical therapy to kind of counsel you through that. But the idea is we need to go above and beyond what you're already doing today. So if you've had 10 extra pounds on you for the last five years, we need to do something that's more than that to stimulate bone to grow. Um, oftentimes I'll also have patients who are in the low end of normal or underweight category and I really encourage um, seeking guidance from a nutritionist or a dietitian to work through getting into the higher end of a healthy BMI. That's also part of the treatment for this is that we want to be in the normal range but we want to be toward the top of that range. Muscle weighs more than fat and that means if we're strong we're gonna weigh more than if we're skinny fat, is what I call it. 
where there's more you know, adipose tissue, which is that fat, fat cells, that's just gonna add to the load of a fall. Whereas if you are strong and you have heavy muscle, that's going to be shock absorption during a fall. So that's a really good question and point about body composition, when do I use the vest? Really the vest can be added at whatever weight you're, you are as long as you're not having pain. Ah, perfect. So kind of like how I showed with the chair. So the question's about gardening. How do we do proper lifting without um, bending at our spine? So I, I showed you lifting the chair. I'm just gonna demonstrate that again with a pretend chair. So I'm gonna hinge at my hips. And if I still can't reach the item, I need to bend my knees more, right? Well, now my hands, you can't see them, but they're still not at the floor. So I'm gonna actually bend even more at my knees until now my fingers are touching the floor. My back is still straight, and then I pull the item toward me, and then I stand up. So that decreases the leverage to your spine when you have whatever it is close to you. Notice I was facing away from you. If an object was where you are, I would not do this to pick it up. I would face the object and then bend and pick it up and then I would turn and put it where I want to put it. So that's safe, proper lifting techniques. Now this is again where flexibility comes in. If you can't bend forward at your hips because your hamstrings are too tight or you have back pain, go to PT. That's the whole point. That's what we do. We love doing it. Um, you can come see me or my 10 other friends <laughs> down there. So how do they schedule? Do they need a referral from their PT? Yes. Yes, so scheduling physical therapy, what you need is a referral from your primary care provider. You, if you have already talked about um, you know, a follow-up for a DEXA scan with your provider, you more than likely can send a MyChart message just to follow up about that visit and say, hey, I just heard this live stream on Facebook from the physical therapist. Can I go to PT to learn an exercise routine or learn how to move better because my back still hurts when I garden? Something like that. And then they can say, hey, that sounds like a great idea. I'll send that right over. Or they may say, I would like to assess your back pain before you go to PT. Come in for an office visit. We'll look at your back. We'll get the referral going for PT if that's the next best thing to do. So yes, you do need a referral. And that is all the questions. So hopefully short and sweet, give you a little taste of it. And if you have further questions, my email address, I will spell it out for you and maybe we can post it on there. It's M for Mary Breckel. So it's M-B-R-E-C-K-E-L at jeffersonhealthcare.org. And if you send me an email, if you have a follow-up thought or question, I really like talking to people in the community, and I will get back to you in the next day or two. And we will also post this presentation on the rehab page. So if you look on the hospital, on jeffersonhealthcare.org on the website, and go to the rehab page um, under the departments, you should find that there. <laughs> awesome. Great. That's it. Thanks again for joining me. And Stay safe out there, and we will maybe see you in the clinic.